everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode for the well-being in higher education. Um, and this is hosted by the Cambridge Center for International Research. And in the third episode today, we have um, the amazing Dr. Juan Camarena Figuera with us today to discuss race and racism in higher education. So I will first introduce um, Monica, um, and then we will start our discussion. So Monica Morena Figueroa is a Black Mestiza woman, associate professor in sociology and fellow in social science at Dawning College at the University of Cambridge. She co-leads the Decolonized Sociology Working Group, and with Dr. Ella McPherson, she runs the End Everyday Racism Project, a web-based platform to report and monitor racism in higher education. From 2017 to 2021, she was the University Race Equality co-champion at Cambridge. Her research focuses on the intersectional lived experience of race and racism in Mexico and Latin America, anti-racism and academic activism, feminist theory, and the interconnections between beauty, emotions, and racism. Monica is an award-winning teacher and pioneering advocate of education as a form of social change. Since 2010, she co-leads an organization, the Collective for the Elimination of Racism in Mexico, COPERA, dedicated to making of racism a public issue. And she was my PhD supervisor. So I'm very, very happy to have you here, Monica. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Hannah. Nice to be with you. Of course, thank you so much. So I just want to jump in and talk about this very important topic. Um, and what I would like to start with is what does racism look like in the higher education context? What can you say about that for us? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question in terms that, in the sense that it doesn't look any different than in any other sector necessarily, but that what we need is to be able to separate it between the different areas where it can manifest or develop. So there is um, an institutional sort of level, like the ways in which institutional racism works anyway, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. Um, there is like at the institutional level, um, there's also how racism manifests in the pedagogic area, like in the teaching environment, in the, in the interaction between lecturers and students in terms of both content, but also how the space is organized and structured. There's also racism in the university as a working space between colleagues, between staff members, you know, and at the interpersonal level of relationships between people and between any kind of people that intersect in this space of the university. So, and I think you can say that for racism anywhere, you know, that it is um, a way of organizing resources and distributing opportunities and privileges in any different in any kind of space and um, and what we talk about racism we're thinking about how that organization of resources and distribution of privileges is given in relation to a specific um, historical built up traits of the peoples and their bodies and a relationship between, it's a biocultural relationship between how people look and the, what that looking like supposed to represent and historically what it has meant. So I, I can, I mean, it's a very broad answer, but it is a, it is a, a challenging question in that way. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, of course. And I think that's a very, um thought-provoking thing to think about distribution of resources and privileges. Um, yeah. And I know your research primarily focuses on Latin America and you're working in the UK. Um, so is there anything you can say about the differences between not maybe these two contexts, but anywhere else that you would like to talk about in the way these resources are distributed? Well, I think it's really important to notice that although we talk about racism as if it's a given thing, a one thing, um, it's easier when we try to understand different contexts to look at how the racial projects in each 
space or the, each geography have developed. So something I like to, how I like to refer to this is that there are, according to the different experiences of colonization and the development of racial thinking, there are different racial projects in the world. In Latin America, most of it, there is a big, um, a particular kind of racial project called mestizaje, which is, has to do with mixedness and mixture, where mixture was something, racial mixture, racial cultural mixture was encouraged and has been encouraged as a way of organizing how racism would work. Where it's, I mean, this is very broad, but very different to places where the one drop rule or uh, laws against miscegenation and di these courses on miscegenation have developed where there is a position against any mixture. So that has a lot of implications. I mean, it can also parallel to forms of either assimilation or um, what we would call segregation. I mean, of course, some places have all of these together, but in different degrees. So um, Latin America is a context where mostly assimilation, assimilationist racial projects operate, like mestizaje is an assimilationist kind of project, where people are, in, are encouraged to assimilate, to bring together, to like, in this, in this um, sort of welcoming of mixture, assimilation becomes a way of surviving and a way of negotiating this distribution of resources. So you have to mix in the right way. You have to mix with the right people to look in particular ways, etc. Whereas in other contexts like the US, like the UK, uh, in other parts of the world, segregation has been what underlines these racial projects. That is like, you know, these indigenous people live on one part, white people are separated from people of, of color of, you know, pe black people, Indian people, etc. So it's like this notion of living apart. And of course, this is all fabricated and it's all an idea and it doesn't really work like that in reality. But racism is that it's a, a force explanation of the world and a forced division that is uh, enforced on top of people, right? So we can see that that sense of uh, segregation um, dominates certain parts of the world mm -hmm. so that we will divide it in that broadly that kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for that. And would you say that this broad difference um, in Latin America and UK, US in terms of assimilation versus segregation. Is, um, is this also experienced like this in higher education contexts? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, we would need to think about it, but I guess, first of all, if, it, if these higher education contexts are set up in these geographical spaces with these particular histories, it will affect, of course, the same. So. Um, but this doesn't mean that these ideas are not cross-crossing or fertilizing each other. So in places like Mexico, uh, this notion of being mixed, of being in Mexico is called mestizo, the, the favored subject of the nation, which is the mixed subject, but mixed in a very particular way, um, would be uh, who gets prioritized to be, for example, the academic, you know, the, 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 the right mixed person. And that person would get benefits and would get more privileges within the university space, either as a student or either as an academic. And of course, as well, the whitest, uh, well, not of course, but the whitest mestizo person would then also have more benefits. So it, it has a, in some senses, it's similar in that there is a hierarchy where white people are positioned at the top and, and then other peoples are, you know, especially black people get to be at the bottom in most, most racial hierarchies. Um, but then this issue of mixture then ends up marking differences between how 
people are seen or not. Whereas in a context like in the US or the UK, the degree of mixture might just like you are of color or you are not, you know, you are BME or you are not BME. So that, that marks a difference, how much you can negotiate and move around or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. So would it be correct to say there is more, um, there's also the inclusion of colorism in the context um, of Latin America versus the ones where there is segregation? Well, colorism is an added variation to um, this situation. I think colorism is a term that comes more from a context of segregation from the US and the UK and European context where the people of, that are already in the category of being not white, mm -hmm. you know, have then an internal organization based on skin color. And that skin color, the lightest and the darkest, uh, will affect how they get benefits or not in, in society. And so the lightest person, but still they are a person of color, although the lightest person might get more benefits or less benefits. Yeah. In the case of Latin America, almost the whole hierarchical system is also a skin color stratify system where colorism will be amongst even the people that are whitest. So that's why I say in my research that people are whiter than or darker than, and that is how it's, it, the organization gets done. So you will get just a better situation in life more broadly if you are whiter than another one mm -hmm. person or in a particular context. It doesn't matter you are white or not because that category of being white you know, although there are some people that call themselves white or that could be considered white in, you know, um, more European standard white, um, it, it doesn't necessarily act in the same way. You know? So there are these slight differences where people have other ways of maneuvering their position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that clarification. So from there, I want to move on to, because you've already mentioned a little bit about what gets people, um, especially academics, be in a position of more, um, you know, ha have the status of being an academic versus not depending on what's assumed to be race. So um, could we talk a little bit about the types of race and racism um, that are experienced by staff members versus students. So are there any differences in the way they experience racism? Oh, well, um, I think for that, I, I guess after this discussion a bit more broad, I mean, I think it'd be better to talk about this in relation to the UK, which is a context where I'm more familiar with the university, the higher education sector, and I've done some work on that. Um, more than more activist kind of work rather than research related, but that gives us some ideas about it. And um, I don't necessarily think that staff and that there's a distinction between how staff and students experience racism uh, necessarily. The main thing would be the position of power that students occupy in relation to staff members, to professors, or to even administrators or other people where they would be at the disadvantage in relation if they experience racism from the you know from their lecturer from their uh, teachers professors the supervisors and um, so what but the kinds of racism that people experience the way that they would feel like they have access or not to opportunities to promotions to a treat a better or less no less good treatment in the classroom or in the working environment. I think they almost are organized around the same principles. It's like either you belong to a particular um, group, ethnic, racial, or ethno-racial, and you have particular body and particular embodiment, particular characteristics, um, that will determine your your access or no access to certain resources or not. You know? So mm -hmm. I think I think it kind of crosses all of all of the people in 
I mean, every, it, this is an empirical question in a way. We will need to see a case and we will need to see how exactly that panned out. But overall, what we can say is there is less people of color, less black people, less Pakistani people, let, you know, and this being a minority also has an effect on the ways that they are um, being treated, the way that their themes or interests are considered, um, et cetera. No? So there are various different logics. I think the degrees of power mm -hmm. that the people would have would have um, a lot to say for that. Yeah, yeah. So would that then um, make any difference in terms of whether someone can report an act of racism, um, whether they're a student or a staff member? In what way would they feel empowered to do so or not? Well, I think that brings a different aspect to it, which is the culture of complaint of an institution mm -hmm. and how much there is... Um, trust that the institution, whoever takes that complaint, will do something about it or will effectively, um, yeah, follow procedures and what kind of procedures. So I think that building that trust and building that opportunity for students and staff to say, look, this is what happened to me, is a big challenge for all institutions. And the, where many get stuck is like people don't believe that they their their um, claims are going to be upheld. So I think the problem here, what we have, is a big chain of uh, situations where if you don't have enough people that understands the issues, they don't have to be necessarily people of color, but sometimes being people of color in power affects and helps and supports that fact that other people that are being affected by racism will say, okay, I will claim, I will bring my complaint because I feel I will be understood. Yeah. So, but you have that, that problematic, you know, who is developing these spaces for complaint complaints to be received, but also to act on them. You know, what is the history of an institution responding to racism? And I think that will enable then the person, either the student or the staff, to feel powerful enough or to feel in, empowered or encouraged to bring their issues up front. So it's a double task where you need to actually build that possibility and demonstrate with acts and not just words that effectively you will be taking things seriously. And that's always a challenge for institutions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially in the UK. Yeah, yeah so speaking of that, um, I know some of, or maybe all of your um, data on this is coming from an initiative that you have called End of Day Racism. So would you be able to talk a little bit about um, that initiative and what that gives us in terms of understanding the structure of racism? in the UK? Well, yes, and I think we can both have a discussion on this since we've worked together on it. And, um, but yeah, what I think is, um, well, this project, the End Everyday Racism emerges precisely in this context of how do we offer an independent, um, trustworthy space that takes on the complaints of students and staff and is able to uh, build a map and give some resources to back up the claim that racism exists in universities. Mm -hmm. I think that was the very first issue that the project wanted to respond to. Like there's a constant denial that these situations happen. And this constant denial or constant belittlement that that is something worthy of notice is very exhausting for the people who are um, suffering racism or witnessing racism because there's a constant disbelief that what happens to you or what you've seen happening is true. So the project wanted to kind of address that problem and help organizations and groups, student groups and staff groups to have data of some kind to say, look, I'm not crazy. This is what's happening and it's happening to a lot of people. 
uh, or to more people than just one. So it becomes a tool that is a bit of a, um, a tool that wants to respond to the need of data from institutions, which are constantly saying, prove to me, show me, give me the numbers, tell me how many people, if it's true or not but also to create in that space a sense of solidarity and, a, and companionship and say, look, we listen to you and we're gonna put this information forward so that you don't have to leave this on your own. Mm -hmm. So that's what the project wanted to do. And one thing very particular that also we wanted to add was like, we're not only gonna prove that this is happening by just adding these reports, but also give people the opportunity to express how racism affects them at the emotional, physical uh, level. So in a way, we don't want to just repeat and give an account of the multiple stories of how racism is lived, you know, from something that was told to me in the street or in the restaurant, in the cafeteria, in the classroom, to attitudes I've seen, to limitations to my freedom of movement in a space, etc. Uh, but also, because those stories, uh, in a way, they repeat. We need to see how much they repeat, but they are similar stories. Mm -hmm. But also to just understand and get a grasp of the amount of psychological distress, emotional upsetness, and physical um, sort of consequences that racism has in individuals, and then how that adds up to an institutional picture. Mm -hmm. So the project also does that. So it asks about what emotions did you feel, what emotions you uh, received from the the person that was or the group or the situation that racist incident we call them and um, how did you feel in your body as well what that implication so the results are really impressive in that sense that show like you know how people felt uh, frozen nervous um you know uh, well anger felt despise directed at them, felt, you know, mis misrecognition, all, all a series of things that will be then accounting for how racism is not just a superficial thing in a way. It's not, yeah. does it, it's not like, oh yeah, it's not something without consequence in a way. Yeah, so there's so much I would like to ask um, about these, but maybe we can also just add a note here and say that this is not a formal complaint procedure, right? It's more of a, you know, the, for the solidarity aspect and to make the case that racism is happening in these institutions, but that doesn't lead to a formal complaint procedure. Yeah, no, I mean, the system is, it's a web-based platform system where people log in and after an authentication process, so to verify that the person belongs to the institution, in this case, the University of Cambridge. And then people will produce this, you know, account and they will tell the story. They will click on all these different options about how they felt, where were they, what happened, what, who was the person or the groups or the situation that affected them, etc. At the end, they can people can download a PDF with all their information, and then they can use that if they so want mm -hmm. to follow up a um, formal procedure. But that will be like in another in the official channels. What we wanted is to offer that buffering space of solidarity, of welcoming, of saying we believe you. We want you to you know, uh, bring your issues here so that you can organize them and that you can feel like really listen, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's in this online way. And, and then you can take that forward if you need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. So it's um, the, the idea that people experiencing racist incidents and not being able to um, have someone listen to them in some cases or um, feel like they can report them. And then the gap that Endeavor Racism fills there is, is very, very important. 
Um, I want to go back to um, this disbelief about how racism does not exist in any one institution. So um, on the one hand, I can understand where that's coming from, but at the same time, it's just denying something that is so obvious. So what is going in, in an institution when they just ignore the very existence of racism? Well, I mean, gaslighting or gas, it's a very common thing, you know, and it goes for all kinds of oppression, racism, sexism, classism, ageism, adultism. I mean, it, it's intrinsic to its very working logics that we, that as a society, we are organized to put some people in charge and others not, and then justify that, and then not understanding why would anybody want it differently, or what, what's the problem, right? So that happens for, you know, why would a woman want to run a company? What, I don't understand. Why do you want to go to study? Why would a pe person of color not feel included here? What's the problem? You know, that kind of, um, repetitive thing uh, of denial mm -hmm. um, it's one of the logics that sustain the oppression sustains it working you know so it, it totally makes sense that some that many people actually would doubt even like did that happen to me what, what is that an issue actually maybe it's normal right so all oppressions racism included have that ability to sort of um justify their own existence, mm -hmm. reinforce and normalize that they exist. You know, this normalization of oppression, yeah. it's a very common um logic of how um how you know how they work, how oppressions work and how they get established in a way. And because they are rooted in the body, particularly sexism and racism, they seem to kind of almost close a circle, a knowledge gap where we are like, oh, well, it makes sense. You know, it would make sense if you are, you know, women shouldn't go out at night because they are delicate and they are fragile. Look at their bodies, they are not strong. Therefore I'm right, therefore women shouldn't go out, right? So these things happen like that, you know, like, oh, Black people are criminals or are, you know, lazy. Indigenous people are lazy because it's in their bodies. Look, you know, this is what happens. A black person has this tendency. Therefore, they shouldn't be doing this or they, sh they will do that. And so the body becomes a place of confirmation of an idea mm -hmm. in a very sort of pathologically almost, you know, circle, vicious circle way. So that's kind of what we need to interrupt, you know, interrupt yeah. those ideas of how, you know, one thing gets connected to the other. Mm. And I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I think the focus on the body here is, is the key thing here because it, it, it is the way that race is constructed and it's the way it's reproduced and it's the way that this initiative is also challenging that by making it um, apparent that there are bodily um, reactions to racism. So just maybe tracing that is, is one of the key things to work against it. Well, there are two things what you're saying. So on the one hand, there are bodily reactions to racism, but on the other hand, the body is used to justify racism. Yeah. Yeah. So like it is based on that like, you have a particular body, a particular skin color, particular features, particulars that correspond to a culture and to a particular way of being in the world that justifies the place you are in society, right? So that's like at the one level. So therefore you are not able to escape your body because I cannot have another body. Therefore I am located in a particular place. And on the other hand, the effects of racism are, um, they have a long life in the body. You know, many illnesses, uh, certain groups of people have more pro 
um, tendency to have certain illnesses in, according to the racial group. And that's not, you know, I don't know details with precision, but I mean, there is research on that. And that's not free, you know, that's not just like gratuitous. It's because there is a historical relationship between how, um, I don't know if black people have more high ra rates of hypertension is not random. Right, it's not because they have something in their genes. It's because society is organized to put particular burdens on black people, right? Or, or the same with any other. You know, you can do analysis in that connection. So the effect, the emotional effect, the physical effects on different racialized groups in terms of mm -hmm. say diabetes and indigenous people that have to do with particular poverty connections and the way that there, you know, some, I mean, talking about indigenous is a very big term, right? So what, what do we mean specifically? But, you know, there are connections that can be made in terms of how racism, structural racism affects individuals and their groups and their possibilities as, as, um, as societies to move forward, you know, so, so we, we could make that separation. I don't know if that helps, you know, we can make that separation. Yeah, yeah. And that also makes it obvious how um, the, the connections that you're speaking about are usually ignored or not seen. And that also resides in um, not being able to validate your emotions. And it, it might be easier to um, talk about an overt racist attack because it's visible, but these links that you've been talking about, they are made much more invisible and hence yeah. they might be more difficult to combat. Yeah, I mean, overt racism is something that is more rare in a way and it's yeah. becoming, and that's the excuse for many people to say, oh, there's no racism. There's, I don't see anybody screaming. I don't see a sign that says no dogs, no blacks. I don't see you know, a particular segregationist state with the, you know, where white people are only in this area and black people are in this area, whatever. And we don't see that and we, or not as much. And we might think, oh, we've progressed. And some, yeah. many students write about that. Oh, we've progressed, it's not the same. But racism as any other oppression have a very particular way of reproducing itself and becoming, you know, transforming. And also what we are, the biggest challenge is that we're talking about historically produced structural racism that is embedded in the ways in which not only our institutions work, but our, how our minds are wired and our institutions are wired and you know so it's very very complicated in and deep in a way how these logics work it that also makes it clear that we need to be thinking about um that racism is not something just that it's it's about it's a matter of a changing an attitude or changing a way of thinking individually you know it has to do with it, it's a it's a it's um yeah it's social it's collective it needs a collective answer and it needs a collective response mm -hmm. um yeah sorry could you repeat that i think our voices just overlapped no no like a collective a group response a society response you know to this structural more depth and deep sorry, more deep uh, connections. Mm -hmm. So from on that point, I would like to ask, um, so you've talked about End Every Racism and that's a great initiative that's coming from um, the reports that are submitted by students, staff members. Um, and then what other responses can be given to racism in higher education apart from the initiative that you've started? Well, um, this initiative is just like a contribution, you know, like I think anti-racism, uh, one contribution of the many that can be made. Anti-racism overall, it's, um, 
is a, you know, it, it doesn't mean one particular way of combating racism. It's overall, a, can be a political stance, a way of um, organizing education, a way of thinking. I mean, it, it's, mu it's much broader, you know. I think this, this tool, uh, the end of everyday racism is just there to support other anti-racist initiatives or anti-racist actions. And definitely they cannot be done without taking into account other oppressions that are interacting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like for anything you need to consider how intersectionally it's working, you know, how sexism is operating as well, how other, you know, class distinctions, other oppressions are, you know, sex, sex, sexuality uh, distinctions are operating um, simultaneously. So, yeah, when we talk about anti-racism as an overall discourses and practices against racism, you know, you're talking about many possibilities, you know, and they go from institutional in higher education. It could be from how the classroom is organized, you know, how do you teach and what do you teach and what sort of topics and ideas you bring, uh, how do you treat your students and how, or how do you treat your colleagues, uh, your classmates, um, yeah, there are many possibilities. <laughs> Anti-racism is overall um, a way of approaching a society that is very oppressive mm -hmm. and that is oppressive at many levels. So, yeah, it's about organizing as well. It's about bringing other people with you to not to interrupt, as we say, to interrupt racism and just. In a way, racism is a lie, right? It's a lie about who we are as people and who we are uh, as a community and what can we do as humans. So anti-racism would be dismantling that lie and constantly working at saying, look, we are together. We are not divided by these things. We, we can all think, we can all work you can all you know have we all deserve the same respect etc and some of us have been more affected let's recognize that work with that some of us have been more privileged let's accept that work with that etc mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um related to that i wanted to ask you um in the or in, in yeah in the anti-racist movement let's say um, we can talk about different groups of people who are subjected to racism, indigenous people, black people, um, you know, wide variety. And would the movement be more effective if we treated these groups as one whole? Or would it work better for us if we looked at the specificities of each? Well, there's that's always like a very difficult question in, relate, in terms that on the one hand, we want the recognition of how, say, as a Black person, racism, anti-Black racism has specifically affected my life and my people's life. And that's important to address. The same would go for, you know, Indigenous peoples, for Muslim people, for um, Jewish people. So you can have, you know, thinking about anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Indigenous racism, anti Chinese racism or anti-Asian racism. I mean, there are specificities that need to be understood. However, all of them are crossed by this main characteristic, which is how privilege is organized around these oppressions. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that we can look at the specificities, the question is not just how I've been affected by, but what is one earned or who is benefiting or what situations are being benefited by my dispossession or by my, my um, um, disadvantage. So whenever we ask for disadvantages and, and as specific as they can be, we also need to ask for the advantages, 
you know, who is getting the advantage or what is getting the advantage. So that connection and always in relation to each other is really, really important. So, you know, because we can go into the same sort of division of thinking and, and that also breeds more division. Like, oh, you know, as a black person, I suffer more than as a Muslim person or as an indigenous person. So therefore I need more attention than you. And that it just divides further all the people that are actually together receiving mistreatment from, you know, uh, people in power. So that's kind of really important to, to, to acknowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not either or, it's not like, yes, let's just do an anti-Black race. This is very important to understand how anti-Black racism operates. Um, but also really important to understand how uh, whiteness operates and how privilege operates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I want to go back to what we were speaking earlier about um, initiatives and um you know in especially in higher education um and you talked about um how it is important to look at how the classroom is organized how the curriculum is organized um so i was wondering if you could speak a little about what institutions can do um when they're presented i mean they, they should of course wait to be presented with evidence of racism but um what can they put on top of for instance, the initiative that you um, are part of or um, any other recognition of racism in, in a higher education context? What is the role, the responsibility of these institutions? Oh God, well, first of all, I guess it's, the, it's taking it seriously, you know, acknowledging it that, okay, we're not gonna just dismiss this. There's something that we need to, to investigate, talk about it, think about it. Um, and one big challenge is that in that response, usually people think that because they've responded saying, oh yes, it's, let's take it seriously, that is enough. Mm -hmm. And that is just like the very, very first step, you know, acknowledgement, accepting, you know, it's just like the very, very point zero of a long way of addressing injustice. And that's something that we need to, to think about because many institutions act as like, if we just say, yes, we have an office that looks at that. We have, we put a position, we just, uh, a post on, you know, an anti-racist, you know, SAR or chair or um, champion. That is like, that's the work done. And that's not the work done. The work done is when there is no more racism, when there is no more injustice when there is no more uh, people that are feeling mistreated because of, of that. So, so that's, that's something, you know, important to acknowledge that as Sarah Ahmed has written, that that's not th just stating that something will be addressed is not addressing it, you know, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, but it's important, you know, <laughs> it, just, it needs to happen as well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think, you're asking me what can be done, right? Those are the yeah. that's many questions. Is to be very, very mindful that it is a process and that we are all learning about it. Yeah. And that it's a process that in itself requires a lot of care so that it doesn't produce further division because racism with all the other oppressions are very pernicious and vicious. And it's, it's, it constantly dismantles itself in a way, you know, it dismantles the, the initiative. So for example, if we start an anti-racist or we want to create an anti-racist environment. And then that becomes itself oppressive of other people because they don't know exactly how to act and what to do and what to say. Then it becomes a persecution, you know, of like, oh, this is the right anti-racist, you know? And I think that's not correct, you know? <laughs> there are many um, things to experiment and to learn about. 
And we should be just open to that. I mean, uh, particularly academia is very prone as a space to get it right, to mm. have, you know, to get it right and to be almost perfect, you know, so that, and that is very contrary to the spirit of education, which is to experiment, to learn together, to, you know, so in what I'm saying is like, we try one strategy, we try say, you know, to bring a discussion into a group and then we run with it and we flexibly see what happens. You know, I can see spaces where first, you know, everybody's very open to have anti-racist discussion, uh, discussions on racism as a way to tackle the issue. And then, that same discussion turns against its people saying, well, if you don't get it right, then you're not a good anti-racist. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a very fidgety, like difficult arena that we need to be flexible and open. The main thing that it does is to divide us as people. That's the objective of racism, to divide us as people so that we are not trusting each other to be together. So black people don't trust white people, white people don't trust black and everybody else in between, you know, there is like, oh, you know, they must have other motives or whatever. So I think that's where it gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. We need to have a very open and flexible mind to do anti-racist work co 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 with the mission of not leaving anybody behind, anybody. You know, because racism affects all people in this circle, white people, people of color, you know, that that's the main division that organizes racism, right? And then it divides us in between like the good anti-racist white people versus the bad anti the bad racist, right? And that's already a way of not acknowledging the complexity of the effects of racism in everybody's lives. You know? So it overall, if we think of it as it confuses us all about who we are as humans, mm. it brings division between us. That could be a way forward to say, let's not let it bring that division. Well, it's hard, but it is the job, I think. The same that happens with sexism. You know, we think the problem is like, oh, men, and then women that in between women and then in between men. So I think if you were to tell me the one thing that people can do is start by checking your own internalized racism. Mm -hmm. What did you learn? You know, what did you learn? How do you react? What do you think about yourself and your people? Do you think you're better than or worse than or like, where did you get that idea? It's like almost like work in yourself a bit more so that you have a bit more clarity about what things are going to make you mistrust other people and not work together. Because definitely this is not an individual pursuit. There's not much I can do alone about it. You know, I can only work with others. I can, you know, we think better in teams anyway, but anyway, this is a collective, it's a public issue. It's a collective issue, it's a social issue. So the responses I have to do are, are in that level as well, collective, mm -hmm. social, group. I love this framing of process and this, you know, um, whole checking in with your self system. Um, I, I was just thinking, as you were speaking, one of the, ways institutions tend to respond to racism um, is to provide training to their staff members. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak a little about um, whether you think this is a right strategy, what, um, is that enough on its own? What else can we do? Because I have this feeling that once there is this training, they're like, okay, we've done what we what we can, um, and we're you know we don't have any other responsibility anymore. So, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, I'm all for training. I think training is very important. Uh, having information is very important. Having clear information, just the fact to say, look, races do not exist. Race racism is a lie. Just really get that. <laughs> You know, that would be really important information to have and to be clear about. So, and other, you know, there's how, what race means, how 
races have been, the idea of race has been constructed historically, what's this discourse, da 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 da, da. I think it's really important to know and understand. The problem is the kinds of training and the kinds of methodology related to that training. So if I'm just thrown in data or information about this is the law and this is what it says, nothing secures that I'm going to take that on board. So I think part of the training where most of it fails is in the way in which it gives the link between that information and me as a person, you know, like what that has to do with me or how do I kind of connect and how do I apply it and, and the follow up. I mean, it's so people are so invested in not seeing as racist that nobody's going to ever believe they have a racist thought or that they have an, you know, uh, uh, they do, a, they make a mistake that that prevents real true learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, much of the time, I think I would say we're all racist. We're all because we live in a racist society. We all learn to mistreat each other in racialized terms because that's what we are, you know, wired with or whatever since we are little. So we need to have spaces to discuss this and to see, but we need appropriate spaces where these connections are carefully open and where everyone feels that they can make questions and they can learn. I mean, it's really hard when somebody presents itself like I am the expert on this mm -hmm. and everyone else doesn't know anything and I'm right and you're wrong. And, you know, it is. So I think, well, in summary, I think <laughs> training is good, but what training, who gives mm -hmm. it with what methodology is really important, what follow up it has. And it's not the only thing, as you said, you know, it's not enough to just throw in information if it's not done adequately. It needs a process and it needs a follow up. But we do need information. I mean, we need clear, truthful information. Mm. Thanks so much for that. I have just one final question um, for anyone listening or watching. What is one thing um, that they can do to fight against racism today? One thing that you can do is, well, as I said, check, what about you? You know, mm. start with you. You know, what is, um, what's your story? Write your story, for example. That could be a very one good thing. Write or tell yourself or record in an audio message your own story about racism. When was the first time you saw racism? You experienced some, um, somebody being abused in front of you or yourself. And what did that do to you? you know? mm -hmm. How did you learn then to proceed after that? I think if we were a tiny bit aware of the ways in which we were affected, you know, so say for example, that every time I miss, like I doubt about my capacity to be clear, for example, when I teach, every time I doubt, I go back to, oh, I've learned that black people are stupid. How can I dare to be a lecturer or an academic? So I need to kind of understand that connection because that's going to stop me from not only doing my work, but also organizing with others because there's this idea that black people don't think, you know, that are stupid, literally. And that has been, you know, that, are, that has to do with um, scientific racism and all these ideas that black people have the smallest brains and therefore they don't think well and da da da, da. so it's all lies but that's being really rooted so the more i understand that the more i can then come up and say look no that's not true i can see that's not true and maybe i need other people to do that with and that exploration but i really encourage people to be serious about this we are all we have all been growing up and been developing in this society that is a racist society, you know? Since, since 
the European expansion, racialized ideas have been spread all over the world. And this is the moment we are in. We have all grown with ideas of hierarchies in our societies that have to do with people's bodies and people's or, or, and group, groupings of people and hierarchies of power amongst those people. So there's no way out of this, but acknowledging how that has affected me and how that has affected my people and how that I reproduce that with my children or with my friends or with my family or whatever. So we need to start with that work. I mean, if I say, if there's, I mean, there are many, many more things. Read, get, you know, go to training, get together with other people, organize, 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 and know yourself, you know. But, but I think I could start with just that one action. That's a very powerful and difficult thing to do, mm. but necessary. I love it. I think that's very, very powerful. And thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to find that very useful. Um, mm. Do you have any final words, Monica? Anything that I missed out that you would like to add? Well, no, no, just thank you for the opportunity to re kind of revisit all of these ideas and just to think about them together. And um, some are specific to the university, the higher education, others more broadly, but overall it's a worthy discussion that we need to have again and again and again. And um, I hope people find it interesting. I'm sure they will. And thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I just want to note if anybody would like to find out more about um, Endeavor Racism, it's at racism at cambridge.org. Yeah. Um, any other links that we need to share, that we would like to share? Well, I mean, it's my web page in the Department of Sociology at Cambridge, and there is there are some more links there and things about what I've done and publications and yeah. Brilliant. We're going to put a link um, in the description for people to access those. And for Spanish speakers, you can put the link of Copera, this collective for the organization of racism in Mexico, which I lead, and that has a lot of these you know, has put in practice a lot of these training with a specific methodology. So people might be wanting to know about that too. Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much, Monica, again, for everything that you've shared. It's been my absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Hande. And thanks so much for everyone listening or watching. Um, this was Wellbeing in Higher Education podcast, and we're going to be back with another episode soon.